Good morning, Green Valley Baptist Church. For a dollar each, you can come up and look and see this wonderful sight that I get to see this morning. So you're missing out, though, I'll tell you. You're really missing out. You're a wonderful, wonderful to have you here, wonderful to see you. If we have any visitors here this morning, there's a card in the seat pocket in front of you. Please fill that out and either put it into the uh, offertory as it passes you by or take it out into the foyer afterwards. And, uh, and if you go out through the foyer, if it's your first visit, they have a gift for you. So it is wonderful to have you here. We're so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here personally. For those of you that are new, I'm not the pastor. I'm one of the deacons, uh, Brother Ken. Uh, our pastor, Brother John, is on vacation, so you lucked out and you have to put up with me today. Okay, so we have some announcements this morning. There is a men's Bible study. We'll meet on the second and fourth Thursday of the month at 8 a.m., so please come to that if you can. That's a wonderful time. We have a life group meeting at Bob and uh, Peggy Blacker's house on Thursday evening. Homes of Hope. Homes of Hope, we have met our goal. Homes of Hope, for those that you don't know, uh, is a missionary trip. And you can sign up for that still if you'd like to go on that. You have uh, for the next two weeks to sign up for the Homes for Hope. And you, the church, have graciously given to help uh, support that and pay for people to be able to go to go into Mexico and to build a house, which is really an amazing thing to build a house in two days. Mission breakfast will start up. The first meeting will be Saturday, September 16th at 8 a.m., and you can come to that and listen to our first speaker, Pastor Eric Brand. Uh, should be a wonderful uh, meeting. The first Wednesday potluck in September will be, it says in September, it says we'll be in October, so you can figure that out, let me know. We have uh, some free books out in the foyer. Uh, we will be taking an uh, Arizona mission offering. So if you want to give to the uh, Arizona mission offering, you'll see in your bulletin that there's a little piece called Multiply, talking about the offering for, for Arizona specifically. Please put that in your offering envelope and mark that to be for the, or mark on the check filled out to Green Valley Baptist Church, mark on it that it's specifically for the Arizona missions. Also, if you want to give to the disaster relief for Houston and the areas near Houston that have had the flooding from the hurricane, uh, you can also fill out your check to Green Valley Baptist Church and then put on the, the memo line on there uh, for the disaster relief or for the Houston disaster, but write something on there. If you want to give cash, put it in one of the little envelopes and write on there that it's for the uh, disaster relief. And we'll be sending that money to the uh, Southern Baptist Association to go towards the disaster relief. Okay, let's see. Um, Homes of Hope within the next two weeks, disaster relief. I got that. I got the things that people caught me on at the last moment there. Um, you can also check the bulletin board out in the foyer for any other announcements. We have a lot of things going on in this church. You're a wonderful group of people and lots of fun fellowship going on, so check that for more information. Okay, this morning, do we have any birthdays? Anybody having a birthday this week that'll admit it? Nancy, you admitted it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> any other birthdays? David, are you going to admit it? Okay, we're not having a birthday for David this week. <laughs> I could call you out. There is a list in here that talks about all the people that are having their birthdays this week. Are we having any anniversaries this week? If you're having an anniversary, let me know when, what day, and how many years. Anyone? Okay. Well, we have a very simple week for anniversaries. Well, then let's take a few moments to, again, welcome one another. So if you would please stand and shake the hand of somebody near you that you haven't met or haven't seen in a while. <laughs> I didn't say hugs, I said shaking hands. <laughs> Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. 
us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons of God, that we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Amen. Again, I want to remind you, if you want to look at a hymn book, the numbers are in the bulletin. Uh, we're going to do one that talks about the Savior leading us all the way my Savior leads me. 680. Here we go. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Does anybody know who wrote this hymn, the text of the hymn? Okay, who was it? Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby, who you're related to. Yes, That's sir. right. We just sang, we just sang, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Do you know that Fanny Crosby was blind? In almost every one of her hymns, she talks about seeing. Isn't that awesome? Do you know that that's a statement of faith? And one that ought to remind us, too, that one day we'll know him as he has known us. And we'll know him fully. And we'll see it like we've never seen before. What a great thing to follow the Lord. Let's sing that last verse. All the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my fall. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, God, we, we cannot thank you enough, Lord, for, for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and paid the penalty. But, Father, we can't thank you enough because he was raised from the dead and we have eternal life. 
we who believe and have accepted him as Lord. So, Father, we come to you now to give you our thanks. And, Father, we come to you now to give you our praises because of your wonders and your glory. But, Father, we also come to you now to give you the burdens of our hearts. Father, there are many among us that are sick, so many with cancer, and so many that are recovering from surgeries, and so many that are about to have surgeries. And, Father, we pray for each and every one of them that, that you would give them comfort, that you would give them healing, that you would... Father, if they need it, that they would accept eternal life. Father, we also pray for the disasters in Houston and the areas nearby with the flooding all the way from Houston and Rockport all the way up through into Louisiana and even up into Tennessee. And Father, we pray for the victims and we ask that you give them comfort and, and that they would know the hope of loving you, Lord, of giving their lives to you. And we, Father, we ask that you would give those that are there that are helping them, the, the disaster relief people and the ordinary people that have gone to, to give them assistance, you would give them strength, and you would give them a heart of service, and that you would give them the courage to show others that, that they love them unconditionally. Because, Father, we know that you love us, and so help us then to love the world. Father, we pray this and so much more in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Let's continue worshiping the Lord through song. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee. Foundations quiver 
Um, this morning when I was uh, walking around trying to greet as many people as I could, I saw some people here that we haven't seen for a while, so I wanted to welcome them back, Marge and Bill, and uh, Bill and Bev, it's great to have you guys back. Now before you leave today, please say hello to our visitors, we have some visitors with us this morning too, so would you guys bow with me please? Father, we. Uh, are so grateful that you have given us uh, so many material blessings, Lord. When others around the world and the country are suffering, so Lord, we uh, it is our desire, Lord, that we share some of what we have for the ministries going on around the world right now, Lord. So we pray that you will bless this offering, you will bless those that are giving, and I pray this in Jesus' precious name, Amen. Good morning again. You know, we just did the missionary moment talking about the disaster that happened with the hurricane in Houston and, well, on Rockport up through into Louisiana and, and all the way now up into Tennessee. There's been flooding, and it's just one of those reminders of what happens in the world that makes it difficult for us. You know, there's times that we that we have things happen in our lives that we don't understand. There's, there's dark times that come into everybody's lives eventually. I had a, a pastor friend once tell me that you're either going through a dark time right now or you're about to, which is a little morbid for me. I'm an I'm a optimist. I believe in abundant joy and a life full of joy. And So I've been thinking, and, and the Lord's been impressing upon me that that there's something that we need to do. There's something that we need to do to help the world. The world is in such turmoil right now, and not just from earthquakes and hurricanes and natural disasters, but so much turmoil because of the, the political climate. We've got somebody testing nuclear bombs that's, that shouldn't be, and we really shouldn't be. We have, we have people killing off others that, for the simple reason is that they don't like them. They don't like the the way they look or the way they talk or the way they smell. I don't know what the reason is, but we have people killing people. We, we have 
a large part of the world believing that there is no God and that we as humans are trying to become better and better and, and believing that through evolution or through our own desires, our own education, that we can make ourselves better. And, and I don't know about you, but when I look around, that doesn't seem to be working. I look in the Bible or I read a history book and I see that two or three thousand, five thousand years ago there was murder and there was lying and cheating and, and all manner of horrible sins and we still have those today. In fact, I think we've gotten, I, I dare say, better at them. We've gotten worse at them. We've, we, we can do them in so many different ways. We've, we've improved the technology so you can hurt someone more ways now than you could hurt them three thousand years ago. And so God's been impressing upon me, what can we do? You know, I I also work for a living up in Tucson, and and when it rains really bad, we have homeless people sleep under part of the the overhang on the building where I work, and and it just breaks my heart to see homeless people and not know what to do. And I've been asking the Lord, what can I do? I, I don't want them to live that way. I don't want them to struggle with addictions, and I don't want them to to be homeless and without food. And And so I've been asking the Lord, what can I do? What can we do as a church? What can we do as Christians to to help the world? We have have an an overabundance of sin. In fact, as we read through our text, if you would, turn in your Bibles to James chapter 1, and we're going to start in in verse 19. As we read through our text, we're going to run across a word that you probably don't know in the King James that I'm going to read from. Your, your translation probably has it in a word that you would understand, but that word is superfluity. So you get a lesson in grammar today. Superfluity. What is superfluity? Superfluity means an overabundance. And we have an overabundance of misery. We have an overabundance of, of suffering. We have an overabundance of sin in the world today. It just, it just breaks my heart and I don't know what to do about it. So like I said, I've been, I've been praying to the Lord and, and He impressed upon me, well, let's look at it from different angles. I want you, Brother Ken, I want you to look at this as the world looks at it. Let's look at it as the scientists look at it, if you will. The scientific view that, which isn't really scientifically proven, just a lot of people that call themselves scientists say they believe this that we're nothing more than a bunch of atoms and molecules banging around in the universe and we bump into each other every once in a while and and nothing else matters. We're just chemical reactions and physical reactions. And and so what's the point of man? Why do we need to worry about suffering? Does a a molecule of air care if it bumps into this podium? It doesn't care. So I guess suffering doesn't matter. Well, I know suffering matters. It matters in my life, and I know it matters in your life. I know that point of view is not complete. It's an incomplete point of view. It's an incorrect point of view. You might convince yourself that you're not suffering, but (laughs) you're suffering if you believe that all we are is a bunch of matter in this universe, and nothing else matters, just existence. Well, what about... What about economics? What if we look at it from an economic standpoint and we think, well, all we need is more money. All I need is more money and everything would be better. What would happen if we printed enough money that everybody in the whole United States was a billionaire? Would that solve the problems? What would you do with a billion dollars? Would you go down and buy a new car? Who are you going to buy it from? Everybody's a billionaire. No one's going to work. No one's going to sell you that car. Are you going to buy a new house? Who's going to build the house? No one's going to build anything. They've all got a billion dollars. So money is not the answer in and of itself. It can't be. It's just paper or stuff on a computer where they enter it and say you have it and you never see it. Is it, is it money? Is it pure science? What about, what about religion? Does religion help? If we all come together in this room and we say, we say, okay, we have a superior religion. We are the chosen people. There's nobody else. And we're all going to stay together. And, oh, we're really sorry about the suffering in the world. But you know what? That's your problem. We're separate from everybody else. Does religion in and of itself solve the problem? If, if religion says, 
oh, we need to go and help those that are suffering. And anybody in that religion, everybody in that religion says, we need to go, but I'm not going. Are they going to affect any change? Are they going to help anybody if no one steps up and does anything? So it's not religion. Well, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it philosophically. Why are we even here? What is the chief end of man? What is the purpose that people are here on this earth? I really hope it's not just molecules banging around, and I know it's not that. We're not just a chemical reaction happening in this room. I know that's not true. There wouldn't be thought. There wouldn't be emotion. There wouldn't be love. You wouldn't even be here. I wouldn't have to wear this coat if we were just molecules banging around in this room. So that's not it. What's the chief end? Why are we here? What are we here for? You know, I prayed to God and asked Him if He could help me to understand what we could do. And He pointed me to this, this scripture here. He pointed me to James chapter 1. So if you would, follow along as I read James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. A superfluity, overabundance. Lay aside all filthiness and overabundance of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and does not doer, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridle not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religious is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless, and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we study this, this precious holy word that you've given us, Father, as, as we look into your word, I ask, Father, that we would see you. I ask that what we hear today is from you. Lord, please do not let me give my opinion, but Lord, let your will, your word, your truth be heard. And Father, please, let it change our lives, Lord, so that we become doers of the word. Father, show us. What is it we can do? Tell us, Father, why we're here and, and what you would have us to do in this world in this time in our lives today and every day of our lives. Father, we pray this in, in earnest. We, we, Father, we come to you and we say, here we are, Lord. Father, we are here to do your will. Father, we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Superfluity surpassed is the title of my sermon. Superfluity, overabundance, one of those King James words that we have such trouble with. An overabundance. I said overabundance surpassed. We have an overabundance of sin in this world, and we've gone beyond that. We have way more than we need of sin. It's just become horrible. You can't, you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on the news. You can't even trust people anymore, the news or the papers or the... You, we don't even know where to turn. It's so prevalent. There's lie atop a lie. There's just all manner of horrid sin, and we don't even know where to turn. It's become, we've gone beyond overabundant. We've gone beyond that. It's just everywhere, always there. So what can we do about it? 
to what we just read in James. If you back up a couple of verses in James, in, in verses 16 and 17, it says, Do not err, my beloved brethren, for every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from God. So what can we do about this? Well, we can pray to God to tell us, to give us the gift of understanding, the gift of knowledge, so that we can know what to do to help in this world that is just overrun with sorrow and pain and suffering, with death and destruction. That's what we need to do. So I've set this up now as, as if we're in a race. Remember, Paul talks about us running the race. And really, we kind of are in a race. In fact, we even call it the human race. I've set this up this way. On your marks, ready. When I was a swimmer in high school, they didn't say on your marks. They said, ready, set, and then they shot the gun, and we all jumped in the water. Ready. Are you ready? Are you ready to run the race? Are you like a runner, a sprinter in the Olympics? Are you down and ready to go? You're thinking about what you want to do. You're, you've, you're on your marks. You're, you're set and ready to go. Is that what you are to help the world? Is that where you are right now to help the suffering around you? Is that where you are? Are you ready to go out and to make a difference in people's lives so that their lives can be better? That's what we need. Well, how do we do that? Well, here's three things he shows us. First of all, swift to listen. How many arguments would happen in this world if we listened instead of reacting first. You know, there's that, that silly adage, if you're, if you're in a war or if you're in a policeman and you're in a bad area, shoot first and ask questions later. Ready, fire, aim. That's backwards, isn't it? Don't we need to aim first? Don't we need to be ready to listen before we react? That's what we need to do. He says... Let every man be swift to hear. You can hear me right now, but some of you might not be listening. Do you know the difference? Early in the morning when I get up to go to work tomorrow, I'll hear the alarm go off, but I'm not going to be listening for it. I'm not going to be intent, wanting to hear it. I'm not going to be looking for it and thinking, oh, I want to hear what that alarm is telling me. No, I'm going to be asleep, and I'm not going to be wanting to get up in the morning. There's a difference between hearing and listening. Did you ever talk to somebody, and you say hello, and, and you tell them something, and you can just see it in their eyes that they're not paying any attention whatsoever? I guess I'm not the only one. I knew people ignored me. I didn't know they ignored all you. We don't need to do that. We need to make a commitment because the Lord says we need to be swift to listen. We need to make a commitment to listen. Let's not get mad. Let's listen. I don't care what they're doing. Does it say here, let every man be swift to listen to those that deserve to be listened to? Does it say, let every man be swift to listen to those that we can get something out of, they're going to pay us, somehow we're going to get back? It doesn't say any of that, does it? It says be swift to listen regardless of who it is that's talking. You mothers in the audience, if you're anything like my mother, you love to listen to your children. You dads too, you grandparents. I know I love to listen to my girls. My girls could talk an awful lot, though, and I had a limit to my patience. But listening is incredibly important. And God tells us it is. And so that's one of the things. In order for us to be ready to make a difference in the world, we have to be willing and ready to listen. We need to be slow to speak. You ever talk to somebody in conversation, you start to say something, you get one or two words out, and they're talking. You can't get a word in edgewise. They won't listen. They won't, they won't let you speak. Well, I don't like it when people do that to me. I can't imagine how many times I've done that to somebody else, though. Maybe I need to be slow to speak. 
I read this years ago when I was first surrendering to, to preach, and I realized this is very true. And I tried it. I tried it at work back in Arkansas when I was working back there. And I, I was a, a lowly worker, I guess you could call it, although there are no lowly workers. I wasn't in management or supervision or anything, and no one thought anything special of me. And I started to be quiet. And all of a sudden, in people's eyes, I got smarter. I didn't do anything. I just didn't talk as much. It's funny that the things that I speak and I say are the things that get me in trouble. And if I don't talk, I don't get in as trouble as much. Isn't that something? Slow to speak. Don't interrupt people when they're talking to you. You can learn a lot from people if you just listen and then you don't interrupt. Not only don't interrupt, but when you interrupt somebody, you're usually interrupting them to impose your will upon them. Whose will do you want done in the world? Yours or God's? If I try to impose my will upon somebody, then how am I going to get them, introduce them to God's will? So be slow to speak. Swift to listen. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we did that today? If that just took off, if that became the new fad all across the world, you know? Everybody was slow to speak. And if people really listened, what a world we would have. What happens today, though? People are really quick to make up their mind. They're not going to listen. They're going to make their mind up before anybody even says anything. They're already coming up with excuses. They're already coming up with what they want to say, what their will is. They're not, they're not listening, and they're going to speak out. And so much today, people speak out with anger. Remember, to be ready to do this race, to, to be on your marks, ready to go, we need to be swift to listen, slow to speak, and slower to wrath, to anger. We need to get rid of anger. What is it that we're angry at? Well, I could give you a list that wouldn't fit in this room if I just wanted to sit down and tell you everything that upsets me when I watch the news or I read a newspaper or, or I listen to the radio. Or... But why am I angry? Well, I'm angry because I'm letting the rest of the world catch me up in their anger. But is there really a reason to be angry? What's the chief end of man? What is the point of you being on this earth? It's to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And to love your neighbor. Wait a minute, I just said that. Did I say anger anywhere? Did I say get angry at your neighbor? Did I say get full of wrath at God? That's not in there. That has nothing to do with it. If you look here, if you look at verses 19 and 20, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So not only does getting mad not do what God wants us to do, but it works against it. It doesn't, it doesn't fix things. Nobody ever became your friend because you yelled at them. No, I don't think anybody ever came to Jesus Christ because someone was mean to him and angry at him. How do people come to know Jesus Christ? Because somebody is slow to speak, and instead of spending their time talking, they spend their time praying. And when they do speak to you about Jesus Christ, they explain God's holy word, not imposing their will or interrupting you with their thoughts, but they tell you God's holy word and you listened. Don't be too quick to speak. Don't be too slow to listen. But most of all, somehow we need to realize the glory that God has given us, transferred to us, the righteousness that we didn't earn, the mercy that we've been given that we didn't deserve, and there's no reason for us to be mad ever again. 
Even, even righteous indignation where we, we're mad because somebody did something against God. Well, you know what? God doesn't need us to stand up and protect Him. If we try that, we're going to mess it up. So we don't even need to get mad about somebody that does something bad in the church. Oh, somebody came in and they smelled bad. Or, oh, someone came in and they, they colored on the walls some little kid. Or, oh, somebody did something that I just can't stand. That's okay. It's really okay. God can take it. He was able to take it when I was a child and I'm an adult. He's been able to put up with me. He can put up with a lot. So slow to anger, to wrath. Okay, so if we can just do those three things, we're ready to get started. Are you ready for the race? The race to go out and to help fix the world, to take away the suffering of the world? Then we need to be, remember I said when I was a swimmer, we'd get on those blocks and be ready, set. When you're set, when you're, when you're swimming or when you're a, a racer and you, you're set, that means you've set your resolve. That means you've set your mind and your purpose. That means your thoughts are ready to do what you're going to do and you're thinking about what you're going to do. Because what if you were a runner and you were on the track and you're going to run around in that circle and you start off on the straight and then you start daydreaming and you don't know what you're doing and you're not thinking and you just keep going straight and you're out in the parking lot. Are you going to win? We've got to be set. We've got to understand and think in our mind what we're going to do. We've got to have resolve. We, we've got to put our opinion aligned with God's opinions. We've got to take and align our purpose with God's purposes. So even though we're ready and we listen better, even though we're ready and we're not speaking too much and we're not getting mad anymore, we still, if we do all that and we don't love God, it's in vain. It's worthless. So we have to re resolve to align ourselves with God. Look at verse 21. Wherefore they lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, overabundance of naughtiness or wickedness. So that, what that lay apart means is we're taking all of the stuff of the world that the world is teaching us is okay. And we know it's not. Can you see that the way I see it? When, when I look at the world today, it hurts. For them to say that what is an abomination to God is good, and for them to say the things of God are, are terrible or no good, it, it just hurts me to see that. But that's because I've chosen one side over the other. And we need to do that. And we need to do it on a personal level, not just a uh, theological level where we think, oh yeah, there is a God and I choose that God. But on a personal level, we need to choose sides once and for all. Yes, we believe there's a God, but are we going to follow that God? Are we going to resolve in our hearts and in our minds that now's the time for me to do what God says? Yes, I have believed in him. Yes, I've told him he's my Lord. But am I now going to act like he's my Lord and do what he says to do? We need that, that resolve. Choose once and for all. And then again in that verse 21, putting aside all of that filthiness and ugliness and, and wickedness, we need to be cleansed of our filthy behavior. Well, Brother Ken, how do I do that? Through prayer. You go to the Lord and you admit those things that you know you're doing wrong, and you admit to the Lord that they're wrong, and you ask Him, you pray to God to change you, to change your want to's. I'm from Arkansas, it's a want to. Change your want to's. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do, Lord, what you want me to do. We ask God to change us. That's how you do that. That's how you're cleansed from the filthy behavior. You pray to God and ask Him to do it because you can't do it. Remember, I said, the, look back 6,000 years ago. Look back 3,000 years ago. Look back 100 years ago. Guess what? We still have murder. We still have lying. We still have stealing. We still have every one of the sins that we ever had. Humans, are, we're not ever going to cleanse ourselves of sin. We're not powerful enough to do it, and we don't have the will to do it, to even try it. We have to go to God. So we have to choose whether we're going to follow God, and then we have to pray to God to be cleansed of our filthy behavior. He needs to do it. And then, again, that 
superfluity, that superabundance. We need to clear out the superabundance of wickedness. Well, what do you mean by that? What's the difference between cleansed of filthy behavior and clearing out the wickedness? God comes and he cleanses us and he frees us. We're no longer a slave to sin. We don't have to do it anymore. We have a choice. We, before we were a slave because we had no choice, the world has to follow sinful behavior because there are none that are good. Not one. There's none that will choose to be good. But we can choose now because we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So not only do we need to be pray to be cleansed, but then we need to do it. We need to say, God, I believe in you. You're going to get rid of this habit that I have of, I don't know, cursing. Pick the sin. There's so many sins you can pick. Whatever it is that you know by reading God's holy word or listening to his word being preached or listening to hymns and praise worship songs, whatever you know that God's telling you is a sin in your life, ask him to cleanse it and then do it. Stop it. Get away from it. You know, the Alcoholics Anonymous, they tell you one of the things you have to do right away. It, once you believe and you admit and you want to go through those steps to change, it's you have to change your friends. You have to change the things that you do. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to change our minds so that we're not thinking that what the world is doing is fun anymore because it's not fun, it's sinful. We need to know that in our hearts, believe that in our hearts. We need to realize that those things that we do that we just haven't stopped doing yet are more than just an inconvenience. They're death and destruction to us and to the people around us. So we need to clear those out of our lives. Get rid of that super abundant wickedness. Well, how about an example? Years ago, I quit listening to any kind of secular music. If you go in my truck right now and you look at the CDs I have, they're all praise and worship. I cleared out the wickedness of the music that I was listening to. It made a huge difference in my life. I don't drink. And I'm not saying you can't drink because the Bible says pastors don't drink. Deacons a little and the rest of you, I guess, can get drunk anytime you want. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Wait, delete that from the tape. Don't do that. Please don't do it. Can you imagine going to heaven and being drunk and standing before God? Oh, please don't do that. But I cleared out all the alcohol out of my house. There's no alcohol in my house, no drinkable alcohol. I got some rubbing alcohol, but don't drink that either. I took the temptations away of the things that I knew that I'm not supposed to do. Am I perfect? No. You can tell by looking at me I'm not perfect and not sinning. But I can look back at my life as God has led me and changed me and molded me little by little at the changes. We need to let God do that. Pick one and let him change you. Pray for him to change you. You can't just do it. Pray for him. And if it fails and you, you weren't able to get rid of that in your life, keep trying. Keep going. God's going to change you. And you're going to have a wonderful testimony when he does. So be resolved. Resolved. Set in your purpose. Change your opinion of what is good and bad. Choose God once and for all as the standard for good of what you desire in your life. That's what we need to do. So we're ready. We're set. And now we need to run. We need to go. Ready, set, go. The gun's going off on this race. It's time to go. What does he have to say then here? Look at verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, your own selves. Be ye doers of the word. Not somebody that hears and says, I think that's a wonderful idea, God. Let them go do it. Don't be one of those. But you might say, well, Brother Ken, I can't, I can't go I can't get up and move to another country to be on missions. I, I'm not physically capable. We might have people here, we may even have people listening to us that can't even get out of bed. What can they do? How can they go? Well, I'll tell you what, each and every one of us can do the most important thing we can do, the most powerful thing we can do. We can all pray. Make a point to pray. It's something else we can all do. I don't care what your situation is. We can 
read or study God's holy word. Now, you may not be able to actually read it, but you know there's other ways for you to hear it. You can listen to preaching. You can listen only to praise and worship music, which if it's written properly, if it's truly praise and worship music, it has God's holy word embedded in it. You can change your life so that you now are a doer, not somebody that just listens, but also a doer, not a did or done. In other words, have you ever, for those of you that were in business and I've worked in factories and business for 40 something years, I've known a lot of people, including myself, that we would do something and it was important and we got a big handshake and a pat on the back and then we wouldn't do anything else. We would just sit around all day and tell us how good we were because we did that in the past and we wouldn't do anything else. Have you ever known anybody like that? Don't be a doer of the word and do it once and say, okay, God, I'm done. I went and I shook hands with my neighbor and introduced them, introduced myself to him. That's it. I'm done. It doesn't say anything about do once or did in the past. It's doers continuously doing, doing from now on. Pray from now on every day. Paul said pray ceasinglessly. Don't cease in your prayers during the day. Doers. In verse 22, he said, But be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So we don't, we don't need, we need to dwell on and in God's word, not dwell on the rest of the universe. We, what it says here is doers of the word. Well, Brother Ken, what's the difference? Well, the world does a lot of things. Humans are good doers. We have doers that sell drugs. We have doers that are out doing murder. We have doers that are out doing stealing. We have doers that do all kinds of manner of things. We have doers that are out doing wonderful things, helping people to get through the hurricane. We have doers that are rebuilding for people. But if we do all that without love, it's in vain. It's worthless. If we do all that and we don't love God and we don't love our neighbor and we're doing it for profit or we're doing it to make ourselves feel better, then what good is it doing? In the long run, if I'm really nice to somebody, if I help them every day of their lives, if I make their lives here on earth just magnificent, perfect lives here on earth and they die and spend eternity in hell, what good was me having their life be good all their lives? We got to love God. So we need, in order to do that, we have to dwell on and in God's Word. We can't just do it worldly. We need to be a doer of God's will, not a doer of our own will, or we'll mess it up. So determine your goal. It, it says to be a doer... Well, it says here, like someone that looks in a mirror, and then when he leaves, forgets himself. The, the point here, when he talks about the mirror... When you look in a mirror, are you doing anything other than looking at yourself? Can you look in the mirror all day long and get things done? Can you look in the mirror and do laundry? Can you look in the mirror and mow the... No, nobody mows the yard here. Why would I say that? Can you look in the mirror and get anything done if you're just only staring in the mirror? It's vanity if all you do is stare in the mirror, right? So if you're just somebody there that's staring in the mirror and that's your purpose in life is vanity instant gratification for yourself, and then you go to do something else, you're going to forget. You're not going to go do something meaningful. It's vanity to do that. What would you prefer? What is your goal in life? What is the chief end of man? Is it vanity? Is it instant gratification? You know, that's the way the world's becoming. Is, does it matter if I lie as long as I get my point across? As long as I feel good about it? Well, the world right now says lying is okay. In fact, it's almost becoming preferable to lie. I can't believe it, but that's the way people are. Is it okay if I steal? Well, yeah, but they have more than I do, so it must be okay. Right? We need to pick. Are we going to let our values be the values of the world, which are vain, which lead to death and destruction? Or are we going to pick purity? Are we going to pick purity? 
It says in verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God. That's what pure is. Pure is not what we think it is, what people think it is. Pure is a standard set by God. Are we going to choose God's standard of purity in our life? If you want to go, if you want to run the race, if you want to really make a difference in the world, a difference that will last, a difference that is truly a difference in lives, then you must choose purity, God's way. Again, verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We need to delight God with our behavior. I hope you want to do that. I want to do that so bad. I want God to not only just say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to say, it's been a delight watching you. It's been a delight leading you and molding you and changing you. It hasn't, but I would sure would like him to say that. Because trust me, I am not I am not the good and faithful servant that I wished I was. But I want to be. I want to delight God. Do you? If you want to delight God, then you need to delight your neighbor. Remember, it all boils down to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You need to love your neighbor. Here, here's some specific ones right here. To visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions. Well, right now, we can visit a lot of people in their afflictions. This is just specific examples, but this isn't the only list of things you can do. Remember, you can pray for the people that have been afflicted. Hurricanes, any manner of sin, you know, robbery, uh, murder. I, I don't want to name them because I, I, I hate them. Any manner of things in the world, suffering that's going on. You can help those people. You can, you can go and help them. You can go to pray to help them. You can go to visit to help them. You can go and, I'm not asking you to give money, but you can give money to relief funds and things like that. Whatever the Lord leads you to do, you need to delight God in the way you do it. You can help people. The fatherless and the widows. In fact, we have a, an amazing opportunity here where we live. This is a very unique area that we live in. I've never lived in an area with retired people before. We have the opportunity for us who are healthy enough to get up out of our house and go next door. You know, my parents moved here 26 years ago, and when they moved here, it used to be the joke about the Green Valley smile that everybody in Green Valley was smiling. Everybody in Green Valley doesn't smile anymore. The homeless people that live in Tucson and around this area, they don't smile very often. The, the people that are suffering because of all of the sins of the world around us, they're not smiling. We have this incredible opportunity here where we are to get up and to go next door and say hello. We have this incredible opportunity that when we go to the store and we're standing in line and we talk to the checker and we ask the checker how they are and we listen intently. They can see that we care because we're slow to speak and quick to listen. We have an incredible opportunity. So I've been thinking about how can we help? How can we help? What is the chief end of man? Well, that's to love God and to serve God and to delight in God. How can we do that? How can we get humankind, the human race, further along to doing that? We can go and serve the Lord. We can go and we can listen. We can go and not just babble and talk for no reason, but tell them about Jesus. Tell them why we have the joy in our lives that they can't understand. We can go, and no matter what they do, and I know this is hard, we can go and not get mad. We can go and the world can tell us that we're haters and not get mad. We can go and the world can tell us we're fools and not get mad. We can go and love on people whether they pay us back with love or pay us back with hatred. We have a huge opportunity. And I'd like to challenge you. 
we, uh, we had a speaker come in the other day and talk about church growth, and, and I've talked to several other pastors, and I've been worried about this because I, when I was in Arkansas and I was a pastor, I pastored very small churches, uh, 30 to 40 people a lot of times. How do we grow the church? How do we make a difference? This is how we make the difference. We get ready, we resolve, get set, and we go in love and not in hatred. You can't do that without this. There is no evolution where the human race gets better on its own. It can't be done. It won't work. So we're going to have, as we play some music here and sing a hymnal of invitation, we're going to have an invitation. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come up front and talk to me or one of the other deacons. It'll take just a few minutes, and then you can be ready, and you can change and be resolved to follow God, and then we can go and change the world. If you haven't been doing that and you feel burdened by the Lord, as we sing, pray where you are, or come and pray to me, and I'll pray with you to help you to recommit to following the Lord. If you haven't got a church home, and you feel the Lord is leading you to join with this group, this is a wonderful church. I'm sort of preaching to the choir proverbially here. You guys are very loving. You love each other wonderfully here. God's just asking us to do that out in the community too, out in the world. To, let's start a renaissance, a change in the world where people love according to God's definition of love. So if you want to join this church and join in us with us as we do that in this community, in this, this area, as we pray for this community, for this state, for our country, for the world, come talk to me and we'd love to have you join our church. Hymn number 499. Come as we sing. Would you stand please as we sing? I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the cross. Days of darkness still come o'er me, sorrows pass, I often tread, but the Savior still is with me, by his hand I'm safely led. Yes, I'll sing wondrous story of the Christ who died for I'm asking that you would make a commitment today. Recommit yourselves. No more wrath and hatred. Be slow to speak and swift to listen.
Because you love the Lord. First and foremost, love the Lord with all your heart. John, are you doing our benediction? Thank you. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Uh, as I was growing up, uh, my brothers and I uh, heard from our dad frequently, make yourselves useful as well as ornamental. Uh, he was exhorting us to help around the house. I find in uh, James 1.22 a parallel on truth, though. If we're going to have an effective presence, we have to be productive. The Lord wants to shine to the community through us, and we do so when we're about his will. Pray with me, please. Lord, we praise your name, and we thank you for the many blessings that you pour upon us every hour. We pray for your abiding presence with those affected by the flooding in Texas. And that we come through this ordeal and know that you're a God and you are in control. We pray that you will lead us as we leave this place, that we may be filled with your spirit so that others see you and the work we do in your name. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.